Hello and welcome to this Denim Group webinar. I'm your host, Nan Palmero. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode, and we ask that you mute your phones. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please use the chat feature. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. Following the webcast, you will receive a follow-up email containing a link to the video replay. Today's speaker, John Dixon, is an internationally recognized security leader, entrepreneur, and principal at Denim Group. He has nearly 20 years hands-on experience in intrusion detection, network security, and application security in the commercial, public, and military sectors. As a Denim Group principal, he helps executives and chief security officers of Fortune 500 companies and government organizations launch and expand their critical application security initiatives. I would now like to turn it over to John for the presentation. Thanks, Don. Uh, welcome, everybody. I uh, thank you for taking a time out of your uh, busy day uh, to learn a little bit more about mobile application security and uh, how to build a successful program. Uh, put this deck together in this webinar and uh, look forward to getting your feedback. Uh, and I see a bunch of people that are on the, the line. If you have any questions, obviously email me or uh, uh, DM me or you can message me within the WebEx framework. And my email address for the record is john at denimgroup.com. But we'll get going here. And uh, again, the title is Building a Mobile Security Program. But after I finish this, I, I thought that maybe a better description would be Building a Mobile Security Testing Program. Uh, because the focus of today's presentation is how to better understand the risk of your uh, applications uh, for mobile devices built internally and how to gauge that risk from a technical standpoint. So we'll dive in there. A uh, little bit of background on me. Uh, I'm an application security guy by background, uh, security person for 20 years and have been focusing the last 11 exclusively on application security. and. Effectively, what I spend most of my time doing is working with leadership and companies to build out their application security programs, which include mobile testing and mobile app sec as well. I'm an ISSA Distinguished Fellow and uh, have a column in dark reading and do a ton of speaking as well. And like I said, I probably met many of you on the call or, uh, and uh, again, look forward to your feedback today. Uh, for those that don't know Denim Group, we are a professional services and product firm based in uh, San Antonio, Texas, who focuses almost exclusively around the security of software. Uh, we have a, a very deep knowledge of uh, development around software. That's uh, how we're different from others. But in the context of mobile, uh, we have done a tremendous amount of mobile testing in the last several years and have experience helping uh, commercial and government and military clients uh, test uh, mobile applications. We've also helped uh, and done assessments on MDM solutions, on uh, uh, development practices around mobile, and uh, have a deep understanding across the board. So uh, the, much of what I'm talking about today is reflective of that experience. So we'll get going. Uh, as I mentioned, the focus of this is application testing for mobile. I'll give you a quick overview of mobile uh, technology institute, the major ones, and, and, and the marketplace is sorting out that right now. I'll talk about architectures and how they're vastly different from a web architecture that existed uh, and has really dominated many of our careers in the last 15 to 20 years. I'll talk about how iOS and Android are vastly different and how they address security needs and security requirements, and, and that involving things like web services specifically. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about automated testing and how important that is, but also that there's some coverage gaps around uh, mobile testing that are, that, are, that are much more pronounced uh, in the iOS and Android arena than, for example, web application testing. And throw out some ideas at the very end for uh, how to create a repeatable and economical uh, mobile testing program. When I say economical, I mean uh, there is huge pressure to get new releases out and to add minimal cost overhead to applications. So we're trying, uh, so we, optimization of testing is an important uh, uh, key thought here. So we'll get going with that. Uh, one thing to understand, we see testing and application security programs happen across organizations. It's all about the surface attack, uh, the attack surface and the software uh, that is being created throughout the enterprise. And many times mobile and also cloud gets left out. So what we're talking about today is really internally built applications that get published publicly 
on app, uh, app stores, uh, primarily uh, the Apple iTunes App Store and the uh, Google Play application store. But effectively, what we see is that many times mobile gets excluded or is an afterthought, uh, that it's not central to an application security testing program. And if you gain anything out of today's session, uh, you should know that that has to be the case, particularly if you are uh, dealing with private information or uh, with money. Uh, and so we see that as a, as a growing trend. Uh, so let's start in, uh, by diving right into the overview of major mobile technologies. And, I, and I've got you for about 20, 25 minutes, and I want to leave five minutes at the end for questions and answers. So we're going to make a high-speed pass on many of these key concepts, and I will probably not do justice to any of them. And I give you enough background material and also introduce a great reference that we are publishing that will give you more to sink your teeth in, uh, but we'll get going for starters. So the reality of it is, is that smartphone, smartphone applications, mobile phone applications are essentially thick client apps. Uh, their use cases are wildly different from, you know, web applications, obviously. They, they provide things like location. People do dumb things with them by losing them, leaving them on airplanes. Uh, and, and so you have to really view the applications that ride on these platforms vastly differently. A uh, great example that I have is a oil field services firm that put uh, drilling data specifically on iPads had some of the very sensitive computations on how they did testing on the actual iPads. Well, guess what the oil field services guys do? They lose iPads in bars every Friday night across uh, South Texas. And so that, that's the use case of uh, that you can't, you simply can't put sensitive drilling data on mobile devices. And that's, that's a wildly different thing. And you have the you know, executives on one end and then you know, users at the other end that are doing less than optimal things with mobile devices. So remember that attackers will be able to use, uh, get access. Uh, they will have access to binaries, obviously. They will have direct physical access and many times to devices. And as you know, if you're a security person, if you have uh, physical access, game over uh, in most security instances. So you have to build this assuming that uh, and, and you, all of your testing and all your thought processes around security mobile is that work, doomsday scenarios like losing the device and, uh, will happen and that always, always, always attackers will act, have access to binaries, which means they can reverse engineer and get access to source code. And that is vastly different, well, should be different than web application uh, servers uh, to draw a comparison. So specific platforms, obviously iOS uh, and, and Android are the two, the two big ones in the marketplace. They're very different. Obviously, uh, Apple controls the ecosystem of the uh, iPad and iPhone uh, and major releases, and that's a very controlled and and and, and, and you know singular system versus Android which is very different because you've got the different uh, vendors, Samsung probably being one of the major ones, but all the different implementations and the different devices that have different physical hardware attributes, phones that have cameras, some have not cameras, they have US, or excuse me, they allow smart cards to be put in and others not. Uh, Blackberry uh, to a lesser degree, Windows Mobile is out there as well. Uh, HTML5 uh, uh, platforms, and I just uh, read about uh, one of the new devices that Sam Samsung is publishing with its new, uh, uh, its new operating system. So, you know, stay tuned. But those, right now it's iOS and Android, and what we see is most companies uh, standardizing around those two on regular releases. So how are they different? At a, at a, again, at a code level, from an application, mobile application security perspective, iOS is written in Objective-C, obviously compiled to ARM machine code. Uh, you know, local developer, or developers can run the applications on an emulator that's local to them, but you know, obviously anything that's uh, published has to go through the Apple's iTunes store. And it's a little bit different for Android, and obviously it's written in Java and Java source code. It's compiled to Dablic executable binaries, or DEX, and these are run on a Dablic virtual machine. So right off the bat, very different. And developers can run their applications also on a local emulator, but then they, and they can also debug them via a USB connection, which is pretty cool. But production applications can either be loaded, this is also different, from Android via USB or device SD card, and then finally, obviously, from the Google Play Store. So those are, are very different architectures. And right off the bat, we get the question from clients, 
it's the same application, why do you have to test it twice? It's a key question. Well, there's essentially two different applications performing the same function, uh, and they're vastly different. If you get a, uh, anything else out of this session, you'll get the sense of how different they are. So what does this mean for security? It's not just the code running local to the smartphone. It's the application plus the third-party services plus the enterprise services and the entry point into the uh, enterprise. And so there are many different ways uh, that an attacker can gain access. They can you know, steal the device. They can put a malicious application on their device. Uh, they can reverse engineer an application to see what the entry point is into the enterprise. So because of the, the, the architecture, because you have physical access, uh, because you can reverse engineer the binaries, you can do a lot of different things that you didn't have to worry about in a mainframe, in a client server, or in a web application centralized computing model. So the other thing that we that you have to realize as security folks is that the most interesting weaknesses are many times the ones that happen in between the handoff between the application and the web services. So. You know, I'm a, by background a security guy. Uh, I, you know, I'm really focusing this uh, on for my colleagues that are also security brethren. Uh, but you'll quickly, you know, realize that this is just a very wildly different environment from web applications. And just about the time you've got your hands, you know, wrapped around that, we're off to another a world. So we'll keep going here. Uh, for those that are familiar with the Open Web Application Security Project, they are now published regularly a mobile security project top 10 list uh, it, that have, you know, wildly different from the web application uh, top 10 list. So one that we see all the time we'll talk about is lack of data protections in transit. Think of the Starbucks scenario, for example, uh, and then personal data leakage. But that, that the OWASP uh, uh, top 10 list, is uh, fairly new, but I would say a great starting point for resources to understand how different mobile is. So let's talk about how iOS and Android handle security issues differently. And again, I'm giving a prequel to a white paper that we're republishing called the Secure Mobile Application Development Reference, written by Dan Cornell, the CTO of Dinner Group, that uh, covers 14 different areas that are listed on the slide from uh, just overview of app, app development to how devices in primarily iOS and Android handle local storage, encryption APIs, native uh, code execution. And this is a really meaty document. I'm going to give you a quick uh, overview of two of the topics. Uh, at the end of this session, Nan will give you uh, some background. We'll send everybody the reference link to uh, the updated and, and improved uh, uh, reference guide, but this is this document is meant to, to to essentially provide a resource to security leadership to security uh, uh, you know experts who worry about application development in mobile but don't know a thing about mobile development, which is most security people, including myself. So the 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 thing that you can do is when you uh, are asked, well, how do we do this? This is a resource that you can then provide uh, that goes into how the wherefores and hows of secure development around the two major platforms, iOS and Android. So let's give, I'll give you two examples of the 14. One is local storage. So right off the bat, you know, iOS and Android couldn't be more different. Uh, and, you know, for those that have seen uh, how iOS works, it, it, you know, it has a sandbox, it, it's inaccessible to other applications, uh, it interacts with the iTunes client, obviously, um, but you can mark files that are protected so they can only be accessed when the device is unlocked, which is pretty cool. Those are just examples. In the Android, you have lots of storage options, so that op opens, up more, uh, opens up more attack surface, specifically for those that are Linux people, which a lot of security people are, uh, you can apply Linux security uh, models to application files uh, using group permissions. But, however, with the SD cards, those protections may uh, will not be covered. So right off the bat, there is another example. Um, so I, I want to blow through another example, which is the encryption APIs. So iOS uh, provides an access to a variety of key management functions 
that can access various encryption capabilities. It gives you some flexibility there. Obviously, the keychain for those that have had Apple devices, you're familiar with that, allows you to securely store local data, uh, such as passwords and key, uh, encryption keys. Uh, and so the cool thing about that is applications can access those items that are in the keychain, but they are not allowed access by others. Uh, however, on the Android side, you've got, uh, you have access to a full range of industry standard encryption APIs via the JavaX crypto library. Uh, and, and that is, you know, right off the bat gives uh, a much more, I should just more complex or more, there's more moving parts on the Android side. Uh, but, you know, encryption APIs, which are essentially part of every uh, secure development effort in mobile, uh, it, the two major uh, platforms and, uh, are, could be more different. Okay, so let's talk about a, 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 a typical mobile architecture. So right off the bat, uh, that's, this is the, a, a, a threat model, a high-level threat model about um, a, on the left with an application user. Imagine them with a, the phone and that's in the box, the actual mobile device. The application is on the device, but it has uh, access to a file uh, system that could, may or may not be compromised. It could be cohabiting on the device with a malicious mobile application. And what you see with the red lines are when you, uh, tr you know, essentially cross, cross trust boundaries. And, and this is where data or interactions can ingress and egress the device. So not only do you have that where it can interact on the device itself, but it could access uh, enterprise web services and enter the, the enterprise there. Uh, it can also access third-party uh, malicious services as well, or, or you know, send data off to third-party services that are re they're requesting it. So the, the the architecture is vastly different. Uh, you worry about the you know controls and 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 the, the access to data on the device and data that's flying in and off of the device with third-party or trusted enterprise uh, services. And then obviously that application user could be malicious and could be trying to bypass uh, you know, the controls that you've implemented. So the, what that creates is uh, you know, additional mobile threats uh, that around spoofing, spoofing, tampering, you got data disclosure issues, now that you have physical access, uh, you can do some, uh, also some fun D DOS issues and you can uh, uh, elevate privileges. So this, this creates a, uh, a, a different problem set uh, than most uh, recognize. So the, 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 these are different problems. The top 10 list from OWASP is different and uh, we are going to uh, give a, a little bit more of an explanation here why that's the case. Okay, so third par party web services. Um, essential, uh, they can be geolocation, they can be, there's a variety of them out there, they, they add, uh, you know, to the, the service, but, I mean, does, do, do, do most people typically understand, you know, what, what, what they're consuming from a web service? It's absolutely not. And then, you know, you've got Google out there saying that they promise to not be evil, but like for everybody else that's uh, either consuming or serving up web services, you simply don't know. So the thrust is, upon the people building applications to be that, that you know, person making the right decision on behalf of users. Uh, enterprise web services, you know, how, how long have they been hanging out there? Um, how deeply have they been tested? Uh, and, and so one of the things that we see, we'll talk about in a second, is you can minimize recurring costs around testing by uh, but essentially keeping the web services architecture constant or at least knowing when it's changed in a radical way so that every single time you do a mobile application test, you're not having to go look at the back-end web services or entry point as well. So um, that is a, uh, the, you know, w web services are part of the system. So I like to look at mobile applications as a system, uh, not just the mobile app code running on the actual device. So let's talk about uh, repeatable and economic mobile testing programs real quickly so I have some time uh, for questions and answers. Uh, talked about some of these scenarios here. Uh, I'm going to blow through these quickly to get to some of the other juicier material. Uh, okay, so approaches for identifying threats. Uh, you know, essentially uh, you now have to have a little bit more context and a little bit more understanding, uh, particularly for new releases 
particularly where to understand where EPI, uh, electronic patient health information or privacy information, uh, and, and, and that's what we're trying to communicate here. Okay, uh, assessment activities, uh, there's really uh, three major ones, static analysis, which most AppSec people are familiar with, dynamic and forensics analysis, uh, we'll dive into those. And the general assessment approach and idea is to identify uh, what applications have the highest priority to assess and focus in the majority of resources there. You probably want to have some understanding and get access to the source code. You want to figure out what your baseline is for testing and account for risk inherent to the technology and common features. Uh, followed by targeted testing, uh, you want to focus on where data flow comes into the device and out of the device, as I talked about, and develop some uh, abuse cases based on unique features. Uh, so the other thing I would also uh, uh, talk about is reporting and how you want to uh, uh, send those out in a very compact and condensed way uh, and not in the form of a very large consultant report. We'll talk about that too. So static analysis, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, blow through these. Uh, I would just say in, in the context of mobile testing, uh, you can find substantial, if not most, of uh, many of the application vulnerabilities on, via static analysis. You have to use uh, uh, this as one of the testing approaches if you have access to source. You absolutely should. Um, dynamic analysis as well. Uh, it's more time efficient in certain instances than a manual review and also good for testing logical vulnerabilities. And I apologize for going so fast. I looked up and we are uh, 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 you know, burning through time here. So uh, I also wanted to talk about the dynamic analysis tools out there, the major ones uh, and I, uh, that, that, that help on the dynamic side. But I want to focus more on some of the key thoughts here. And uh, uh, so first of all, right off the bat, automated testing, if you're looking exclusively at the mobile device alone and not at the uh, subsequent web architecture, web services architecture and entry points, you're probably doing yourself a disservice. Uh, so what I mean by that is uh, view it as a system, uh, as I mentioned before, many of the, if not the most uh, egregious vulnerabilities are in the handoff to the other components. Uh, then know kind of where to augment automated testing, particularly if you're pushing a release a week in, in how do you do that and how do you uh, do that in an efficient way? We always assume that binaries can be reverse engineered or rooted. So one of the things that we recommend and we see uh, is, in, as a consultant is uh, just, you know, provide access to source. Don't spend some amount of time uh, have reverse engineering the code because we can assume as part of a project that this will happen. So you assume that uh, folks have this uh, that they can do it, and then that cuts out a good 10 or 20 percent of the testing time in certain instances, uh, you know, essentially getting to a point where we know t any sophisticated attacker would be able to do. Context-driven testing is imperative, knowing where, you know, what the data is, how sensitive it is, what those web service calls are, what data that, you know, if you're pulling data in uh, from a web service, does that additional information now make the data uh, more sensitive, uh, that's, that's also important. And I would also say uh, a key thought that we see over and over and over is don't reinvent the testing wheel. If you have, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, releases, if you have access to source, uh, you don't have to test every, every version of the application as if you had no idea about the last one or the two or three versions before. So what you see a lot of times is, uh, you know, sophisticated testing efforts where they make sure that the entry point to the enterprise, the web services uh, that are in use remain constant or have remained constant. Uh, then they are able. Then you're able to look at essentially the the new source code. And if you have access to the last source code, you can do a diff between the two and look at the new functionality. So that even makes the scope smaller. And that's what we would recommend in a continuous testing environment that 
uh, that you don't look at the system as a whole every single time, that you know how to look at the uh, incremental new business logic, the incremental new code by doing a dip between uh, the last version. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, minimize testing overhead. Uh, I remember us doing uh, some of these original projects, uh, you know, three or four years ago, and they looked very much like a heavyweight consulting project with large scale uh, deliverables, you know, uh, novel like report, heavyweight project management that combined uh, probably were 40 to 50 percent of the project itself. So the trend now is really get the vulnerabilities, get, the, get just the facts, ma'am, get it out, get it to the team in time, and uh, and and I really in minimizing project management and reporting overhead is probably the nice way to put it, which is counterintuitive for consultants. Uh, that is, however, different in major releases. Uh, when there's new functionality, you have a new uh, you know, environment, let's say the Apple Watch is a great example, like a new architecture, uh, then uh, you, you need to look at that differently and probably uh, look at it as a, as a new system. And so that's one thing we do with clients is we differentiate it between the incremental testing and the testing for a new capability or new system. Um, then from that, you optimize the testing tempo. And as you know, in the application security world, you're only as good as your last build. The same is certainly true in the mobile world. And so you've got to have some kind of uh, testing tempo that takes into account uh, the resources. You, you don't want your testing uh, effort to be as expensive as the, the, the cost to build the application. And the other thing is we see, uh, at least uh, as a consultant, uh, service level agreements enforced, SLAs, so that you know, we have a tempo where we know an application it needs to be tested on Monday. It has to be back to them by Wednesday or Thursday because they're going out with it on Friday. So one of the things we've uh, figured out, and it's true for external consultants or true for internal testing efforts, you're at the very tail end of the dog uh, the dog's tail being wagged by everybody else, and 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 so you're that last person, typically a last group. That's a tough role to be in, but uh, you can't you can't you know add testing uh, double the testing length that uh, was anticipated. So that's important. Let me talk a little bit about automated testing uh, and then the coverage gaps and some of the things you can do to overcome them real quickly. As we discussed, some tests are better done manually, you know, particularly as it relates to uh, web services specifically. But our approach to testing is to get absolutely everything under automated tests that you can, but recognize where the gaps exist. So this is not a, you know, because we're consultants, we're trying to do everything manually. Uh, we're not, that's not our approach at all. We, we, we try to get everything under automation, but we also recognize that automation doesn't get us entirely there. So uh, automated tools are good to discover the, the traditional types of vulnerabilities that exist, and that's true in mobile as well. So anything that, that, that has a, a decent, you know, it's a coding flaw uh, that's done at the keyboard, you can also detect them still by automated tools, both dynamic and static. However, on man, man, what manual testing does is it finds very interesting stuff to us, like direct object references, the ability to uh, maliciously execute a file, uh, authentication and auth issues, business authorization, those are the types of things that we typically have more luck finding with some level of manual testing. Um, I won't even go down the path of saying, you know, the, the about false positives, but those are always uh, the case in any testing tool, including uh, application security testing tools. But knowing the, the good, the bad, and the ugly is, is an important part. So what you what you really need to do from a the scope uh, scoping standpoint is understand where uh, data is coming in, where data is going out, where it's stored, how it's stored. Uh, if you have application source, then obviously you want to leverage that as much as you possibly can. And essentially, what you want to do is get as much testing coverage around application security with the minimal amount of time. So that you can you know, look your internal client or your client in the face and say, we feel good about this release and uh, let it go. 
And uh, we get asked that question. I get that asked that question personally all the time by CSOs that are our clients, and it's a it's a pretty strong responsibility to say, yeah, we're good to go. And uh, particularly for the banking clients and the people that you know they are essentially asking us to keep them out of the news, uh, and uh, we are that last uh, that last test before it goes out. So we take that role uh, importantly. And the scope of mobile, uh, you know, security reviews is 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 part of that. So, so where do you go from here? And again, I, I mentioned I want to have time for questions and answers uh, afterwards. Uh, so a couple of thoughts, and then we'll jump right into that. And again, don't be uh, shy. I hope you can ask questions, uh, and I will hope I can navigate through uh, the interface to to get those to you. So. What, what should you do as a security person? Obviously, you want to up your IQ on mobile device and mobile device uh, you know, uh, application development as, as, qu as quickly as you can. You can't be smart, uh, too smart about this stuff. And uh, afterwards, uh, our, my colleague, Nan, will send out the, the information uh, about how we will publish this reference guide. That's a good homework assignment as well. But before that, I mean, as it's, it's simple as it sounds, finding out where the smartphone projects exist within your enterprise is a huge deal. It could be in marketing, it could be in the part organization, it could be uh, in, in not in non-traditional IT places. It could be in you know the group that's doing uh, you know uh, interactive programming or you know big feature coming up for the Super Bowl. But that is. That is a key point. We hate to say it is that many times the security guys don't even get invited. They're not even on the front end or not doing threat modeling. They don't even know about it until it shows up in the app store. And we have more than one example where we've talked to clients and they say, well, we're planning to do this. Uh, we're going to go and release a mobile app. And as part of the preparation for the meeting, we go and look at the mobile app that is already in the app store. So that's kind of embarrassing for the, uh, the client. But that happens more often than uh, we'd like, but it's true. Um, so the other thing is getting, you know, assess the security implications of the, the applications themselves, where the data is, what data, how is it coming, where is it coming from, where are you storing it, who, what services, uh, web services, third party or enterprise you're consuming. I mean, essentially at a high level, at a, a two-dimensional whiteboard level, what does it do? I, I showed you that threat model, the stick figure threat model earlier in the, the presentation. If you can do that, as a security point person say, here's where stuff is and here's where it goes in and out. Uh, I think that is a, a very strong victory uh, because I would argue that many people don't, many security brethren don't have that. And then the other important thing is to gauge the organization's appetite for mobile risk, uh, you know, and, and which translates into allocation of resources, either internal or external via consultants. Like, how frequently do you want to test? Do you want to never, ever, ever have these problems? Well, that's, that's super expensive. Um, you know, what is that equilibrium of test to resource allocation? Uh, do you want to get just the majors, uh, the highs and criticals, and can you live with uh, data leakage? And I'll tell you this as, a, as, a, as an example. Uh, we had uh, found a, a mobile uh, vulnerability and we classified it as low. We classified it because it was, you know, essentially a, a data leakage issue, a username and password that didn't, that wasn't in, important, wasn't critical, and didn't work. It flat out didn't work. It was a test thing that didn't work. But this organization was so worried about its reputation, and justifiably so, that it said, look, I don't want a blogger to put this out there and say we found a username and password in their source code. And even if it didn't work, the damage would already be done. So essentially, reputation risk uh, uh, was had elevated uh, a, what we considered a minor data leakage problem up to something serious. So that's important to optimize uh, your testing program and continually do it once your you know things change, uh, appetite risk change, uh, and that you need to uh, update those accordingly. So with that, uh, I did end up at an appropriate time. We do have time for questions and answers, and uh, so I'll just get uh, take some of these uh, as well. This is a fun one. What is the, what are the top scariest vulnerabilities you've seen? Uh, uh, okay, that's a great quest, question. Uh, let me let me start by saying uh, top top three. Let me let me uh, think about uh, top three. Uh, we saw a mobile banking mobile banking uh, application that had no session management on it. So that was uh, 
a unique uh, capability uh, that was awful. Um, we saw a uh, one particular application that had uh, used uh, for author uh, authorization authentication a username, you know, exclusively just a username. You could pass anything into it or other usernames and get in. Um, let me see what else. The other one is a third-party web service that had no TLS implemented. That was pretty from a, a banking app. That was awful. And you could uh, you could do certain evil things there. So we've seen a lot of crazy stuff. And unfortunately, uh, particularly in the mid-market uh, financial services, the, the the really really big guys are are very good at this. It's the the the, the smaller guys, the smaller retail ones that that are uh, that have uh, more challenges. I would argue. So. Uh, we got a question from uh, the field, another one from, uh, thank you, Jonathan Mandel. When do you see mobile, Windows Mobile becoming a focus? Uh, that's a great question. That's probably more a uh, an economic question of, uh, between the carriers and uh, the operating system developers. But right now, it is certainly the iOS and Android. But one thing that I have seen, and you see this with Samsung releasing the new operating system, I think that right now the power is with Apple and Google, and I see specifically Microsoft making a strong play to with AT&T and Verizon to to uh, combat that. So even though it may be at a at a uh, at somewhat of a low point, I see the economics. I mean, right now Apple has. You know, AT&T and Verizon in a in a not fun business place is a nice way to put it. I think you will see the big carriers reaching out to Microsoft uh, to develop a competing smartphone uh, OS that doesn't it is less expensive. Is a nice way to say it. Uh, okay, so we have another question. Uh, what's the basic security? Uh, what's the basic security about le uh, leaving data or sensitive business logic on mobile applications? Uh, so what we talked about about uh, sensitive data on the device is you never want to do it if you can't. Like, like, so essentially, what you're always trying to do is is make a call out to the uh, to the database server and then present the information. You don't want to store anything local unless you have to. Uh, I gave the example of the oil services uh, worker having sensitive computations on running locally. You don't want to do that. And then you want to make sure you implement great session management so that when you close the browser, you're off the device, it, it kills whatever data is there. Those are, those are two or three things that I would throw, throw in there. Um, okay, uh, one from uh, Brian Laflame. Uh, he said, OAuth oh, Mobile Top 10 is a good place to start. Is that a strong endorsement? Are you unsure of its effectiveness adoption? It is a place to start, Brian. And I think uh, uh, Vericode also has a great uh, top 10 list. Uh, I'll put it a plug for use uh, in our colleagues at Vericode since uh, you guys have authored that. It's a starting point. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, we're kind of uh, ones that pick and choose from what's out there. Uh, we certainly don't want to develop another one, a competing standard, and obviously that's uh, like many of these top ten uh, lists. Uh, you know, they're they're subject to human human foibles, but I think they're good starting points. The point, the big point, I would I would add, Brian, is that uh, they're they're vastly different from the web application uh, mo uh, top ten from from OWASP. Um, okay. So uh, one other question, what are some of the top misperceptions about mobile application testing? Uh, I would say misperception, and it's, again, this is ones that you'll have to deal with in the field, is that, you know, to the client, an they, they built one application, it happens to be in two or three different, you know, uh, uh, platforms, iOS and Android specifically. They many times we get the question, why do we have why do you have to test this twice? Well, essentially it's two different applications that have the same functionality, uh, which brings the other question about HTML5, and that's an, an entirely different discussion about well, we just want to build it once and deploy it many different times, uh, or and, and not have to worry about that. That is a different architecture discussion, but I would say uh, that is a specific uh, the, the misperception is you can you know just test once. Uh, I mentioned the misperceptions about automated testing is another one. Uh, I would also say another misperception is that you just really only need to test on your major releases. Uh, you need to do incremental testing uh, in, uh, uh, you know, for, but, but, but my point earlier on that was a, uh, 
uh, that you really want to allocate a minimal amount of time on the incremental testing uh, just because of for economic purposes. So, uh, okay, Th those are the main, we've got a ton more questions. I'm, I'm going to have to uh, send many of these uh, as private responses afterwards. Uh, so I apologize to those that we didn't, we weren't able to address fully. Um, uh, two or three things. Uh, number one, uh, we'll hand this over to Nan. Uh, we are republishing this, the reference guide. He'll give you the specifics about that and where you can get a copy of the presentation and the background. Uh, we are also going to uh, do a deep dive walkthrough via it, uh, Dan Cornell, the author of the reference guide, uh, uh, go through all 14 in November. So uh, Nan will talk about that as well. But I just want to say thanks for everybody jumping on this. I know uh, everybody's busy as heck right now, and I enjoyed it. Uh, I will answer everybody else's questions privately uh, off this, and with that, I'll hand it back to Nan Pal Palmero. Thank you for attending this live Denim Group webinar. We'll be sending you an email with the presentation and also the URL for the mobile reference guide uh, within the next few days. You may now disconnect. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.